I'm very pleased now to welcome my colleague, Angus Veach. He is the data science lead here at uh, Forest Grove. He is an expert in the field of text mining and social media analysis, uh, and of course, NIME. Uh, so he's got a really interesting news case to share with everyone today. Welcome, Angus. Thanks, Betsy. And thanks also to our previous speakers who um, have made the job easy for me in convincing you that NIME can play a really transformational role in empowering business users to make better use of their organization's data. Um, by providing a, 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 a intuitive, visually driven interface in place of code, NIME really does lower the barriers to entry for data analytics, meaning that analytics is no longer the sole province of the data science team or the business automation team. Um, all kinds of users can now have access to data and do interesting things with it. And that's that's what data driven cultures are all about. So this is great news, but it's it's not the end of the story. Because for some tasks and for some users, the NIME analytics platform might actually provide more power and more flexibility than we need. And let's face it, you can't always just fire up NIME and build a workflow. You might be in the field, you might be not in front of your computer. So we need other uh, solutions because in other words, what I'm saying, is sometimes we don't want the whole Swiss Army knife. Sometimes we just want a good pair of scissors. We want a good old fashioned corkscrew. We want a tool that is designed to do you know, one job and one job only that anyone can use. So the question here is how do we package the, the power and the flexibility of the NIME analytics platform into customized solutions that are accessible to, to any business user? The answer is with the NIME uh, web portal. So for those who haven't seen it in action, as we will very shortly, the NIME web portal is essentially a web interface for uh, running and engaging with NIME workflows, but without ever having to see what a workflow looks like under the hood. It's just like interacting with a web page. In the simplest, uh, the simplest scenario, a user might decide that um, they need to update a certain data product. So they'll log on to the web portal with a single click, they'll be able to run the workflow that, that does that job. Or perhaps they want to do that with a few parameters tweaked. They want to filter it to a certain time period or custom, for example. Or in a much more sort of advanced scenario, the user might walk through um, the training and review of a machine learning model. Um, the, the screenshot up here at the moment is taken from a, a workflow on the NIME Hub you can download that does exactly this. So guided machine learning is, is kind of like a, the epitome of, of um, how the NIME web portal can bring together very sophisticated, highly technical tasks and make it um, accessible to anyone who has the understanding of what's going on, but perhaps um, not the luxury of, of diving deep into Python or R and, and, and playing with all the scripts. However, um, if you're like me, you don't want machines making all of your decisions for you. Um, so what I'm going to show you now is a, uh, a NIME web app that helps us with a more uh, traditional human form of decision making. And it's important to remember, even if we do want to train, train machines, we want to keep a human in the loop. So the scenario is this. Imagine you are working for a financial institution and your role involves assessing the degree of risk that certain customers present. And we have all kinds of data points with which to assess uh, customer risk. We have things like credit history, assets, credit risk, and so on. Um, and we have a rough formula, a framework with which we combine these different uh, risk factors to produce a final risk score. Not hard to do. But the challenge is that risk is a it's a fluid concept. It's 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 not something that has an objective measure. Um, the, the factors that go into a risk score have to change in response to, to changing uh, organizational strategies, changing economic trends, societal values, and so on. So, in other words, there are question marks around um, the different parts. What factors are we going to use um, 
how are we going to combine them? What weights will we assign to different components of risk? And there's no magic way of choosing a threshold at the end of the day above which we think that's too much risk. Um, because where we put that threshold will depend on, on the outcome. How many customers do we include or exclude, for example? Or even which customers do we include or exclude as a result? The point of all this is that assigning a risk score and developing the formula for doing so, is, it's the sort of task that would usually be the domain of a, a, a technical expert. There's experimentation and scenario testing and, and knob twiddling that is beyond most of us in our everyday um, experience. But at the same time, this is, these are decisions that need the input of a subject matter expert, the person who actually understands risk and understands the customers. So we could solve this problem by having data scientists on call every time the uh, business user wants to up or update their risk methods and their risk scores. But a much, much more practical and realistic solution would be for the technical experts in cooperation with the business user to use NIME to build a web portal data app that will allow the user to walk through the process um, in a guided way. Now that a web, uh, an app that does this might look something like this. Here's one I prepared earlier. So what we're looking at is the first page in this particular um, NIME web, web portal data app. We can see already that the, we can have three steps involved, three pages. This little flow chart at the top tells us that we're at the first step here where we're going to explore our data. Next, we'll define our risk criteria and finally, finally we'll download, download our results. So the first step here, we've got a, a table that helps the user to review, familiarize themselves with their data, always an important first step. They can drill into certain columns and see how the data is distributed. Um, they can see what sort of values there are and so on. Once they've done that, they click next to go to the next screen. And here's where the fun starts because we get to uh, control the inputs that will go into building a risk score. I should stress this is an entirely hypothetical way of, of, of assigning risk. If you're a risk expert out there, you're probably wondering what I'm doing. Um, I'm demonstrating non web portal and the risk assessment is just a way to do this. So what we're going to do is choose from our um, available risk parameters, our factors, and we're going to choose what uh, ranges in those parameters denote risk. So for example, we have our three nominal columns here. You could have more. In this case, we uh, have one for our debtors and guarantors, one for property, and one for the status of this customer's existing checking account. And suppose we decide that if they have no debtors um, or guarantors, that might be a problem. Suppose we also think that if they have no property to the name, that means it might be a bit more risky. And suppose if they have a negative checking account, that's um, a sign of risk here. Then suppose that uh, if they have only $1,000 of savings in their account, that presents a risk. Um, age, we say, mm, maybe anyone under 30. No offense to anyone in that group. And let's say if they have only one uh, existing credit at the bank. This is our first sort of draft of, of, of saying what features will go into a risk score. Once we've done that, we hit this button down here, apply criteria. And the workflow presents us with this, this chart here, which is telling us that for any given uh, threshold value uh, with a score out of 10, um, how many of our customers would be above or below that threshold? So suppose we picked a threshold of four, um, it's telling us that about 20% of customers would be below that score, that, that level, and the, the remainder would be above it. If we picked a much higher threshold of eight, then nearly all of our customers would be in the acceptable zone. So that's, that's helpful. We know what sort of uh, impact that particular um, formula we've created would have. But suppose we want to know a bit more, say, which customers are being affected. 
the app has a, a second visualization to help us do this. This little heat map here is showing us for uh, members of any, any group that I choose, which are folded to, to gender, how they're differentially affected by the, um, the risk formula we've, we've created. In this case, we're showing, we're seeing that, um, for example, at a threshold of five, 24% of males would be in the acceptable zone and only 13% of females. So even though we didn't build this into our score deliberately, it turns out that genders are not affected equally. The app is set up too, so that we can choose any other um, category to, to review. So let's pick age, for example. We hit our apply button. And now we already know this because we already told the formula that anyone under 30 is a risk. So we, we see this very clearly here that um, this age group is less likely to uh, meet the risk threshold. But interestingly, we see if we scroll down that some of the other age groups aren't treated equally either, even though we didn't deliberately intend for that. Finally, the app gives us a uh, overview of, in very rough terms, which risk factors are driving the majority of the risk scores. And in this case, it turns out that savings and our debtors criteria are accounting for a large chunk of those risk outcomes. We might look at that and say, hmm, savings are important, but they're not, they're not that important. So let's revise our score. So we go back to the beginning of the process and we look at the weights. Now, I didn't mention this, but each criteria has a weight between zero and one that contributes to the score. So let's, let's knock down the weights for those two criteria. Knock down that down to 0.4 and our savings down to 0.4. Five, let's say, and see how that changes the results. So we hit our apply button again. And we've got a slightly more staggered curve here. But more importantly, we can see that savings is now uh, second importance, uh, not first. And our debt is, is way down here. So we can see that this has had a, a, a dynamic impact on our visualizations. You could go through this process over and over again until you've balanced it just right. You've got a, a set of criteria that makes sense and that have the intended outcome. At which point, um, the workflow could do any number of things. It could email the managers of those customers that are at risk. It could save the results into a database so that other processes can access them. Or in our case, um, we're going to pick a threshold, say six, go to our next screen, and it's going to basically repackage our original data with a new column. We've got a, a risk score here and a, a threshold um, indication, color-coded to show whether it um, is above or below the threshold. And we have the opportunity to download our data as an Excel file if we want to explore it that way. So that's an example of a NIME data app. You're probably wondering, um, well, how does that relate to a NIME workflow? Well, under the hood, that app looks like this. This is the, the very workflow that generated that experience. So there's a bit of detail to unpack here, but at a high level, I've separated it into two parts. We've got um, those components or nodes that prepared the data and uh, prepared certain settings that fed into the workflow before we generated the web portal pages. At the data end, we had there's some just some some nodes in here that perform some some various um, operations which we don't need to go into. Um, we also had some settings in in the form of style sheets. So if you've done any web design before, you'll know that um, pages are styled by what we call CSS, and NIME uses the same protocol to um, style its web pages. And in this case, we've front loaded the workflow with those settings. There is also a, um, a custom component here that I've, I've put in where we put in our color codes and our page names, which gets fed to a component that I'll show you in a moment that produced those flowchart headers at the top of each page. 
So each page in a web portal is produced by what we call a component. And a component is just a collection of nodes, much like a meta node, like one of these, except that it has some extra functionality. In a component, if we place certain nodes, like uh, widget nodes or visualization nodes, this data explorer view, for example, the component will combine the outputs of those um, nodes into a single composite view. In this case, we had the, the text introduction from the text output widget. We had the big uh, interactive table from the data explorer node, and we had the data app flowchart along the top of the screen. Um, I'll just plug this component. This is a brand new verified component that you can download from the NIME hub. And with it, you can um, set it up with certain colors and the page titles and a logo, and it will produce the header that we saw. Now, I can actually preview what each page looks like without going into the browser by opening up the interactive view here. And here is like the, 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 the simulation, I suppose, of the web experience. So we can see the three components of that view, the header, the text, and the table. There's a lot more going on inside the second page where we actually did our risk scoring. So I'm not gonna unpack all that. But what I will highlight is the refresh button widget at the beginning of the sequence here. This is a, a really important node that has only recently been introduced. And what it does is it provided those buttons that I pushed that said apply criteria after I'd made those changes to the, um, to the inputs. And each time we push that button, this widget um, triggered a re-execution of all the down, downstream uh, parts of the component, which enabled us to dynamically update the outputs without having to reload the entire page, which previously we would have had to do. So this is this is my new favorite thing about NIME, is the refresh button widget. If you're a web portal builder, um, get onto that one. It's, it's really quite a game changer. The final page, not a lot happened there, except that we um, showed a table view. We created an Excel output, and then we used a file download widget to provide that link to um, download that file. So in other words, if you can build a workflow, you can make a data app. And that's that's the real magic of what the, um, the NIME server and the NIME web portal adds to NIME. I'll finish just by returning to um, this slide that Ross introduced earlier. Now that we've seen the web portal, I'm, I'm hoping that we can, we've put some flesh on the bones of this part of the diagram. So our data citizens can use the NIME analytics platform to make workflows. With the NIME server, these same folk can turn workflows into web pages which any business user can access, even those that haven't familiarized themselves with the NIME platform or who might be add on their tractor and can only, ac only access their, their tablet or phone. So I hope you've um, enjoyed this little tour of the NIME web portal. Um, I'll hand it back to you, Betsy. Thank you, Angus. Uh, really great to see, you know, this relatively new feature of NIME in action. Um, and I hope, you know, many would have benefited from this. Um, risk analysis is a use case that, that many businesses would find relevant. Um, what else in your experience with the web portal can you envision being deployed successfully in such a way? What use case? Um, I'm, I'm tempted to cheat here because the answer is really anything that involves data and involves I guess, more interaction from the user than a simple um, dashboard. Mm. So a dashboard gives us data and we can filter it and that's about it. But the NIME web portal allows the user to make more decisions and to indeed submit their own data. So anything that uses data science and data analytics in any industry could potentially take advantage of it. But um, I'd like to highlight too that it's not just about doing data science or doing analysis. The web portal is also a way for users to submit their data and to get feedback mm -hmm. on their data. So 
you might have a, a, um, a portal, for example, where the user could submit their data that's in an Excel spreadsheet, for example, and it's going to go into the organization's database. Mm. And along the way, the web portal adds the value of doing some data quality checks for them, giving them feedback um, to say that, oh, have you have you forgot to include this column or, you know, this 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 column has null values in it. So it, it, it provides value by um, giving the user feedback on their own input in a way that a simple dashboard can't do. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And I mean, that would be relevant to so many users um, of NIME and, and data in general, really. Um, and in terms of, you know, businesses that are suddenly in a position to, say, NIME customers um, who are in a position to deploy and build data apps and, and distribute insights or, or interactivity in this way, uh, do you think it's a game changer? Um, for, for sure. I mean, the thing that I like about NIME and especially the web portal in combination with the platform is it sort of, it, it completes the circle between all these different types of users. So once upon a time, you might have your, your, your data analysts who would be in their little programming scripting world. You might have your business users. Uh, you might have um, your web designers who produce web pages to, to, to do this sort of stuff if they did that at all. Um, now we have a, a continuum of users that, that, that Okay, you might still have your business user at one end that only uses the final product, mm -hmm. but then you have people who can do the whole spectrum of it. So an ordinary a, a, a data citizen who knows a bit of um, who's a data literate um, can build a nine workflow, and then they could look at the nine workflow that someone else has built for them to use a, a web portal app. And yeah. they could modify it to their own purposes. They can see how it works. They can build a dialogue between all these different types of users. So it, mm -hmm. it really completes the circle. Um, no one's sort of a sole expert in this or that anymore. Yeah, yeah, really cool. Really great way of, um, of thinking about it. Um, so thank you so much, Angus. We'll, um, we'll see you back shortly for the Q&A.